Wonderful. Thank you so much, Ted. Uh, I'm Melanie Kamet. I'm a professor in the government department here at Harvard and director of the Weatherhead Center, as Ted just said. And I'm really delighted to welcome everyone to this event after the airlift, the future of US foreign policy in the Middle East. And we have a really fantastic slate of speakers here today. Um, I'm gonna introduce all of them briefly. And also just to mention a little bit, uh, two seconds uh, on the Weatherhead Center, we are uh, Harvard Center for International Affairs. We really focus on research and we like to bring our research, the research of our excellent scholars in dialogue with people uh, working in the policy world in journalism and so forth. And I think this is really a wonderful event that enables us to do that. Uh, so let me introduce the speaker, starting with my colleague, uh, Josh Kurtzer, who's down the hall in our virtual world. And uh, Josh is professor of government at Harvard. He specializes in international security, political psychology, foreign policy, and public opinion. He's the author of Resolve in International Politics, which was published in 2016 and received the Alexander George Award uh, for the best book published in political psychology. Uh, I want to call your attention to an article he recently wrote for Foreign Affairs entitled American Credibility in Afghanistan, What the Withdrawal Really Means for Washington's Reputation, uh, which is part of the inspiration for this panel today. He's published widely in the top uh, social science, political science journals, and has received so many awards that I'm not going to take up time announcing them, but they are really major awards. Um, Second, I'm really delighted to welcome Natalie Colbert, um, who is the Belfer Center's Executive Director at the Harvard Kennedy School. Uh, before coming to the center, Colbert served in the Central Intelligence Agency for 13 years. Most recently, she was the Director of Analytic Resources and Corporate Programs for the Near East Mission Center where she led strategic management of analytic personnel resources and created a career development seminar for mid-level analysts. Uh, before that, she uh, produced intelligence assessments on issues in the Middle East for the president and other customers in the policy, uh, intelligence, and military communities. And she previously served as an intelligence analyst covering conflict zones in Africa and Latin America. Uh, next, uh, I'm pleased to welcome Clarissa Ward, who I'm sure uh, many of you know is CNN's chief international correspondent based in London. For nearly 20 years, Ward has reported from front lines across the world, from Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan, and Yemen, to Ukraine, to Georgia, during the Russian incursion in 2008, and Iran. Uh, she was named the 2019 Reporter Correspondent of the Year by the Gracies, and she's the author of On All Fronts, The Education of a Journalist, a memoir that details her career as a conflict reporter and how she has documented the violent remaking of the world from close range. Uh, she also hosts Tug of War, which is a new limited series podcast on CNN audio. Uh, our next speaker will be Nabib Bulos who is the Middle East Bureau Chief for the Los Angeles Times. Uh, since 2012, he's covered the, uh, the uh, aftermath of the Arab Spring revolutions, as well as the Islamic State's resurgence and the campaign to defeat it. His work has taken him to Syria, Iraq, Libya, Turkey, Lebanon, Jordan, and Yemen, as well as on the migrant trail through the Balkans and Northern Europe. Uh, I'm really delighted to welcome him. I also want to mention that he's dialing in from Beirut, Lebanon, which I'm sure we're all aware is undergoing so many tragic crises. Uh, and, and that is the reason why his connection with us here today may be in and out. Uh, so thank you so much, Nabia, for making time to be with us today. Uh, and last but definitely not least, I'm really delighted to welcome Mina El Oraibi, who is the editor in chief of The National. An Iraqi Briton, Mina has over 15 years of experience covering Middle Eastern, European, and American affairs. She's conducted multiple high-profile interviews, including with U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, Iraqi President Barham Saleh, President of the World Bank uh, Jim Yong Kim, and Yemeni President uh, 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 Hadi. Prior to assuming her current role, Mina was a senior fellow at the Institute for State Effectiveness and a Yale World Fellow. So thank you all for joining us. And I'm gonna turn it over to Josh now after everyone presents briefly 
Uh, we'll open it up for Q&A. And as Ted said, if you could uh, put your questions in the chat, that would be great. So Josh, take it away. Thanks so much, Melanie. And it's such a pleasure being here with such an incredible uh, set of uh, co-panelists. So I see my role here as twofold. Um, one is to be a, the warm-up act for the more distinguished panelists that follow. Um, the other is someone who works on American foreign policy more generally, but isn't a, a, a Middle East specialist, is I think to lay out the view from Washington, I suppose, and, and talk a little bit about the broader, the broader context. So in terms of, I think, understanding where uh, we're going with American foreign policy, I think it's useful to think a little bit about where, where we've been. So 1989, the Berlin Wall falls, the Cold War ends not with a bang, but with a whimper, um, and the United States emerges on top. And the world's in this really unusual position um, in the sense that the, uh, uh, we have this global superpower where there's no near peer competitors. There's this kind of strategic pause as policymakers figure out uh, what to do next. And uh, in, in 91, then uh, the Gulf War happens. And from an American perspective, uh, it's an enormous success, right? Senior US commanders call it the perfect war. Um, we talk a lot about uh, intelligence failure after the 2003 Iraq war, but it's worth remembering there was intelligence failure in 91 too, but it was in the opposite direction. It was just in a way that helped the United States, right? We underestimated how easy uh, it would be to run over the Iraqi army, um, who was supposed to be the fourth biggest army in the world, um, uh, and, uh, but collapsed much quicker than expected. And so policymakers then in, in Washington really learn from this. The, uh, the, for the rest of the decade, I guess the view from Washington is that the US is, as Madeleine Albright puts it, the indispensable nation, right? We stand taller, we see farther, we're in a unipolar moment, we're at the end of history, we're the global hegemon, we're unbound, we're unchained. Um, so what do we do? So we get involved in Somalia and, and Haiti and Yugoslavia and Kosovo. Um, we talk about the responsibility to protect. We treat as a matter of shame all of the interventions we botch or fail to carry out like Rwanda. And, and we do all these things because we think they're the right thing to do, uh, but also we do them because we can, because who's going to stop us? We're in a unipolar moment. These are the, the, ind these are the dispensations of the indispensable nation. Um, now notice though, these are wars of choice um, and domestically the American public is happy to go along uh, because the cost of these interventions in the United States on relative terms are, are fairly low. Foreign policy is this thing that takes place abroad. Um, the end of conscription and the rise of the all volunteer forces means that a non-random sample of Americans are actually serving and directly bearing these costs. So, so, so then 9-11 happens, right? And the Bush administration strikes back. But uh, although Afghanistan and Iraq, I think today get lumped together into this kind of single undifferentiated forever war, I mean, American kind of popular commentary, I think it's worth remembering that initially they're very different from one another. So um, in Afghanistan, the US has this really light footprint, right? The US sends about 110 CIA officers, 250 special forces who fund and train the Northern Alliance, fight the Taliban on horseback with close air support, right? When you have intel on the ground, you can target much more accurately. I'm later joined by about 5,000, I think, uh, Marines and Rangers. And so in this sense, I mean, despite that really light footprint, right, things go Pretty, pretty quickly, right? US airstrikes start October 7th, I think, 2001. Kabul falls by November 13th. Sure, bin Laden escapes, but up until March 2002, it's worth remembering the US only suffered 12 fatalities um, in, the, in the conflict. So the Bush administration then moves on really quickly to Iraq, where obviously there's a much heavier footprint but 177,000 coalition forces, 130,000 from the US, right? And so here the invasion begins, March 2003. By May, the Bush administration declares mission accomplished, right? Except obviously it turns out nation building is a lot harder than statue toppling. Um, the US shifts to counterinsurgency mode. By 2007, the US is engaged in the sur troop surge in Iraq. And by 2009, the Obama administration is doing the same thing in Afghanistan. So why go through all this? It's ancient history at this point, right? The Berlin Wall has now been down longer than it was ever up. I now have undergrads who were born after the Iraq war started, which makes me feel incredibly old um, and is extremely uncomfortable. Um, but I, I mention this because I think the context in Washington today looks extremely different. And it's really different in two respects. So first, uh, the U.S. now has a near peer competitor in the form of China, right? Washington is looking east towards the Indo-Pacific. 
Now, um, every president since Obama has tried some form of, uh, of a pivot to Asia. Um, um, under the Biden administration, it looks like it might actually be, be happening. Um, notice one justification that Biden gave um, for the US withdrawal from Afghanistan is so that the US can concentrate its efforts on China, right? And I think partially, maybe you can make the argument that this is for political cover um, uh, in the sense that just like Obama sort of um, doubled down on Afghanistan to give himself political cover for withdrawing from Iraq, right? Um, I, you sort of see that the, uh, the Biden administration is sort of making a similar kind of calculation. Um, but I think it also really reflects a sense in Washington that China is being increasingly assertive, right? Whether it's in the South China Sea, tensions on the border with India, a tightening control on Hong Kong, um, the rise of wolf warrior diplomacy, and, and so on, right? And I think the key here is that there's this real widespread perception amongst policymakers in, in both parties in Washington um, uh, uh, that, that China is being more assertive. I think my colleague Ian Johnson has done amazing work sort of questioning how new or assertive Chinese new assertiveness actually is. Um, but I think you see this calculation reflected in things like AUKUS, for example, right? And so um, the US is willing to offend a key NATO ally because it sees its future as being in the, in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and but I think this is also manifested in public opinion as well, right? So not just in the U.S. but also also around the world. So this here is data from Pew, um, uh, tracking uh, public attitudes towards China, not just in the United States but um, are, around a number of, uh, of different countries. And um, this is data is from I think 2021. One thing you see is um, that negative attitudes towards uh, China are increasing around the world, right? And some of this you can attribute to uh, the current COVID-19 pandemic, but but not that's not all necessarily the case in, 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 in other countries, right? So for example, 73% of Canadians have uh, negative views towards China right now. And this reflects the sort of situation with the two Michaels, right? Um, Indian public diplomacy, Indian public opinion is also really soured uh, against uh, China as well, right? This is, uh, this is Pew polls of the Indian public showing a declining percentage of uh, public opinion in, Indi in India that has been like favorable towards, uh, towards China. Um, and this is interesting because in general, right, the Indian government um, uh, fans the flame of public opinion um, against Pakistan, but not against China, right? So this isn't just like an elite phenomenon, this is, this is the mass public one as well. So in this sense, we're, uh, so this is sort of the first key difference, right, is there is a sense that there's this kind of near peer competitor now, uh, the strategic calculus has changed. Um, the other thing that's changed, though, is the domestic political calculus in the United States. And it's not just, it's not that the American public is isolationist in any way, and there's new data that just came out from the Chicago Council on Global Affairs, um, showing that actually American support for the US playing a major role in the world is, is, is really high. It's just that the public doesn't want to have to pay for it. Um, this here is uh, sort of public opinion data that I uh, collected about the war in Iraq um, from 2000. 2010, each dot is a different poll. And so uh, the black line is sort of a smoother, kind of an average saying an aggregate, what, what we think like the, the, the true level of support might or might not be. Um, and basically what you see here is what you see in kind of every kind of conflict, which is that the public's willing to give leaders the benefit of the doubt at first, uh, but as costs go up, as events on the ground sour, uh, public opinion changes, right? It, um, it's fine when things are cheap, it's fine when you're winning, but failing to win is, is, less, is less desirable. Um, and I think you see this uh, especially in, so this is new Chicago Council data that asks Americans, please indicate how important uh, the following factors are to the United States remaining influential in the global stage. Um, and what's interesting here is if you look at all of the top answers that Americans give, the things that Americans say are the most important for Americans uh, retaining their uh, role in the global stage, it's, they're all domestic things, right? It's improving public education, strengthening democracy at home, um, maintaining the American economy, um, uh, producing racial inequality, reducing economic inequality, right? Notice what's way down towards the bottom, taking leadership on international issues, right? Um, the, it's not that Americans think it's unimportant, but uh, they think it's less important than all of these other things. And, and so this was what I think brings us to the Biden administration. So on the one hand, right, Biden is this old foreign policy hand, right, during the campaign, he really emphasized the extent to which he had all of these foreign policy experience, right, unlike, um, uh, unlike his uh, rival, right. But my sense, though, is that his heart right now is really in domestic politics. Um, if you look at how the administration talks about domestic politics, it talks about a transformational presidency. If you look at how it talks about foreign policy, it talks about America being back, right. It's, a, it's this kind of revolution at home, but it's this kind 
kind of return to the previous status quo abroad. Um, and I think it's often the case that presidents with um, ambitious domestic political agendas uh, try to lower the temperature abroad in order to really kind of salvage and protect their domestic agenda, right? You don't want to be like Lyndon Johnson and you know, sink great society over Vietnam, right? Obama, to a certain extent, tried to do this too, right? If you really want to uh, bring Americans health care, you don't want sort of foreign policy misadventures to mess that up. So I think in this sense, the implications for the future of American policy in the Middle East then are really kind of three things. So number one, the Middle East just is no longer a priority to the United States in a way that it was under the previous several administrations, right? This kind of the CENTCOM era, I think it may be replaced by the era of uh, the Indo-Pacific Command, right? And obviously there are some exceptions, right? So we're turning to the uh, JCPOA with Iran, right? You know, if there, I'm sure if there were a movement on the Abraham Accords, you know, folks would be thrilled. Um, and, and I guess it seems like there's some indication that the administration is siding with um, Naftali Bennett's position of shrinking the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, right, as he puts it, right, rather than ending it. But when Biden talks about foreign policy, he's much more likely to say the words middle class than Middle East, right? You sort of see this in everything that, the administration has been saying. Um, this summer, Secretary Austin said the, the four most important challenges the Pentagon faces are the four C's, China, culture, climate, and COVID. Um, the Middle East is nowhere uh, no, nowhere to be found there. Um, you can also look at the order in which Biden called world leaders uh, when, when he was elected, right? The first one he spoke to was Netanyahu, and that was you know, weeks and weeks in. I think, to be clear, right, there, there are lots of worse things in the world than not being the U.S.'s top priority. Um, and I think there's lots of countries that would rather not be the U.S.'s top priority. Um, but it's a very different strategic context. Uh, the second thing, right, is that the public really has this kind of limited appetite for costly interventions. And so I think what you're going to see then in the next few years is that when the U.S. is involved in security operations, it will be done more in that kind of early Afghanistan model, right? Training local forces, sending special ops, air support, the rise of drones and UAVs, I think are consistent with this as well. Um, this matters as much as even if the war in Afghanistan, I think is formally over, the fighting is really gonna persist. Um, it just will be below the public's radar. Um, I think there's, Biden administration talks a lot about human rights, but it's unclear the extent to which um, this kind of human rights rhetoric is actually gonna be reflected in any kind of real um, real, real political changes. The um, Similarly, the Biden administration sort of at the UN, um, General Assembly a couple of weeks ago, Biden talked about this new era of relentless diplomacy, but the administration currently has no diplomats because Ted Cruz won't let them appoint any, right? I think only two ambassadors have been appointed uh, so far, right? And so really the dysfunction of the American political system limits what folks can do. Um, the final thing, um, just to wrap up here, is just to emphasize that foreign policy is often reactive. Just because you deprioritize something from your agenda doesn't mean that it deprioritizes you. Um, the Obama administration also tried to pivot to Asia. It, didn't really get there, right? Got sort of lost along the way. And, and so in that sense, I think uh, um, uh, just because uh, we sort of set up these initial parameters, I wouldn't be surprised if if things uh, veer, veered off tracks. But I will stop here and I'm really looking forward uh, to hearing um, uh, from uh, all, all of the, the, the far wiser uh, co-panelists here. Thank you so much, Josh. I think it's safe to say that you too are very wise. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna turn it over to Natalie now. Awesome. Thank you so much. And thank you for inviting me to join the discussion today. I am truly very humbled to be included with the other distinguished panelists. And I am particularly looking forward to hearing their perspectives, especially for from those who have a lot of ground on the ground experience. I think it'll be really interesting. Um, as Melanie mentioned, I've been trained primarily as an analyst. And so I typically approach these types of questions from the lens of what are the policy challenges? What are the potential opportunities? And so given that background, I've some, structured some 30,000 foot big picture thoughts about you know, what I think will drive and inform some of the US policy priorities in the Middle East moving forward. Um, I would also note though, um, I, I agree with, with what Josh has laid out recently in his article last month that the degree to which the Afghanistan withdrawal hurts future US credibility in any of these different dynamics or regions will really depend on the context and situation. So especially when you're looking at long serving US partners in the region, each of those relationships is different than what what the US involvement was in Afghanistan. Um, so kind of starting with some of the challenges that I see, I think the first is gonna be fairly obvious, which is, is really looking at the persistent security threats. 
Um, and so, as Josh just mentioned, right, even as the US tries to refocus its priorities and resources on China, there will always be some degree of, of um, persistent security threats and challenges in the Middle East that really have the ability to prompt a need for the US to respond, to react, or to draw back in some degree of focus. The first, of course, being the Iran nuclear threat. Um, obviously, the, the priority of this administration right now is to bring Iran back to the table. But we're sort of in a first mover stalled situation at this point, and a lot of the conversation is now starting to talk about what is plan B. And so I think the question on this point, um, of course, is, is whether the US will find itself in a more confrontational path with Iran to some degree um, down the road. I think the, the second bin of, of um, uh, persistent threats that I would highlight um, is from terrorist groups and um, Iranian-backed militia, especially when you look at um, the, the threat towards US interest in particular. Of course, the return of the Taliban control to Afghanistan renews concerns about it becoming again a safe haven for terrorist groups. We're already seeing examples of that with ISIS-K. Um, but I think particular to US interests, the threat to US and coalition um, presence in Iraq from Iranian-backed militias remains an issue. Um, on this point, I think, uh, although a lot of observers have noted there's been an uptick in some of these incidents in 2021, um, I think for now, it seems like the, the US resources, military resources in the region um, are postured to respond or at least to try to deter them for the moment. Um, I think the, the next big challenge I would highlight, um, at least it strikes me, particularly in the context of the US shifting its priorities and focus is that within the Middle East, there's, there seems to be some signs of shifting relations, shifting realignments. Um, the first I would note um, is the role of uh, and influence of China. As Josh mentioned, this um, isn't actually a new a new thing. So much like the the U.S. pivot to to China precedes uh, predates this administration, the 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 Chinese have been um, engaged doing investment in the Middle East for a long time. Um, but in today's context, I do think an increase in tensions between the US and China are likely to complicate relations with several countries in the Gulf, um, particularly those who maintain longstanding security relationships with the US, but who are also looking to build more economic ties to China. China continues to invest a lot in the region. Um, there's concern that they're seeking to establish a military base in the region. They're displacing the US as a key market for Gulf oil. Um, and I think just as an example, um, earlier this month, the UAE presidential advisor warned that it's, you know, quote, gonna be really bad if we're forced to choose between the US and China in the event that there's a new uh, Cold War between the two. Um, I think another angle beyond um, some of the threats is, uh, in this alignment category is um, how the perception that the US is disengaging or, or focusing away um, could actually reinforce ongoing regional efforts to build alliances and jumpstart diplomatic efforts in which the US may not be the central broker. Um, and so one area I think to watch is regional overture, overtures towards Syria. Um, just this past month, both the Washington Post and the New York Times had articles about Syria and President Assad taking steps to normalize diplomatic and economic contact with some of its regional um, neighbors. I think most notably in this space was the Jordanian king um, publicly acknowledging his call with President Assad, which I think was the first in about 10 years or more. Um, they've also reopened their border with Syria. They hosted, uh, for trade rather, um, and they hosted the Syrian defense Minister for Security Talks. Um, the Syrians were also invited to the Dubai Expo. Um, and the, earlier this year, the, the UAE foreign minister called for renewed cooperation internationally with Syria. Now, of course, the US does not endorse normalization with Syria or the lifting of sanctions. But I think that in many ways, the reality on the ground makes it hard for neighboring countries not to interact with Syria. And so I think this is a space that, that will be um, important to watch moving forward. Um, I think another example in this bin would be um, Saudi Arabia and, and Iran opening up direct talks. There's been um, quite a bit of press coverage on some of the efforts at those talks over the past year. I think there's some potential opportunities for that to lead to progress in areas like Yemen, but I think most observers would say that the jury is still very much out on whether those talks will yield anything productive. Um, you know, Looking at that bin of challenges, I think this realignment area is really a space to watch where regional countries are exploring bilateral diplomatic engagement without the US and what that's gonna mean for the US interest in the region um, and areas that we particularly care about. Um, 
As I mentioned, I tend to think of things in both challenges, but then potential opportunities, at least from the US policy perspective. Um, and so in the case of opportunities, I do think there are still some areas where the US can play an important role, potentially even take a leadership role in the Middle East. And so I think the first one I'd highlight um, is again, sort of what does that continued momentum look like on the Abraham Accords, for example, is that, does it look like solidifying more of the people to people engagements among the existing participants, or might there be a push to bring more countries into those normalization agreements? So I think that's kind of an open question as far as I can tell um, by, this, by the current administration. I think on the angle of, of foreign aid and helping um, countries both on economic and health fronts, I think that's still an area where the US will remain involved. Um, one example that really struck me in this area was um, this uh, uh, natural gas um, effort to, to counteract um, some of the energy shortages and electricity crisis in Lebanon, right? Hezbollah was able to bring in some fuel to help offset those issues. And then simultaneously, I think there's, there's a, uh, an effort to try to move natural gas from Egypt through Jordan via a pipeline to Syria into Lebanon. And the US, I think, actually supports this effort, which I think is interesting because, of course, we still have sanctions on Syria. But it's an example to me of where policy efforts like that really have to live in this gray space where it's not just black and white. Um, and in this particular case, right, yes, we have sanctions on Syria, but we also care about stability in Lebanon, and we want to serve as a counterweight to Hezbollah and Iran's influence. Um, I think on this point, just because I find it pretty interesting, I would just reference um, a quote that I really resonated with me, that it's from the director of the Lebanon program at Middle East Institute in D.C., and he basically sort of made the same point, um, his last name is Abi Nasif, that you know, seeking out these types of opportunities, meaning opportunities for the US to build trust and directly engage requires an issue based rather than a systemic and broadly partisan approach. And so I think this issue based idea is a really interesting way for the US to continue to have um, uh, a role and influence in the Middle East. Um, you are seeing the, the this administration continuing to announce um, large age packages they just announced um, in August, $100 million in additional economic support to Lebanon. 165 million in additional aid to Yemen. Um, they provided more than 3 million COVID vaccine, uh, COVID-19 vaccine doses to the region. So I think that there are areas there where the US will continue to provide from an aid perspective um, that, that support to the Middle East. The last thing I would highlight that, that I would find interesting, and I think that um, there might still be a role for the US to play in the leadership context, is climate issues. So obviously this is a, a key global priority for this administration. And I think, um, again, it could be an area where the US could continue to play a leadership role. And um, I, I think has willing partners who in the region who would support reducing emissions and investments in new energy economies. I'll be really curious to hear what the other panelists think about whether that's, um, you know, where that might go. But just kind of looking at the activity so far, John Kerry has been to the region several times. The, the leaders of Israel, Saudi Arabia, UAE were invited to President Biden's uh, climate summit in April. The UAE also hosted a, a climate dialogue in April, which John Kerry attended. So you're seeing a lot of activity there that I do think suggests there's still a role for the US to play on that topic as well in the context of opportunities to stay engaged with the Middle East. Um, so I tend to end on a bit of an optimistic note, but you know, obviously there are still complex and dangerous challenges for the US in the Middle East um, that will still require some degree of focus. But uh, again, I think there are also opportunities to stay engaged and maintain a leadership role. So I will stop there. Great, thank you so much, Natalie. Really valuable overview of the challenges uh, landscape facing US foreign policy in the region. Uh, so let me turn it over now to Clarissa. Uh, thank you very much. It's been so fascinating listening to Joshua and Nan uh, Natalie, forgive me. So um, I basically thought I would just talk a little bit about my experience in Afghanistan on the ground this summer. Obviously, um, some of you may know that I was there as the Taliban took control of, um, of the country. <laughs> and it was a pretty wild ride. And it was a very challenging moment, one of, one of many challenging moments in terms of US credibility in the region. But I think this one seemed to kind of symbolize a lot about the US's presence more broadly speaking over the last couple of decades. So I was driving out from Kabul to a province called Ghazni, 
which is about three, four hours south of Kabul. And it is in, it was a Taliban, this is before Kabul fell. This is when the, the security forces and Afghan government were still in charge. So you had to drive through a front line from government held territory into Taliban held territory. And we drove two hours outside of Kabul. We get to this checkpoint and we can hear a lot of gunfire. And what we quickly realized is that Taliban snipers were firing at this checkpoint and at a, a small Afghan base, at Afghan security forces base on top of the hill, just overlooking the checkpoint. It was a very uncomfortable position to be in because our cars were kind of smushed between the, the base and wherever the snipers were, we couldn't see them exactly. But as we were trying desperately to, you know, honking our horns and trying to get the cars to move through so that we were not in the firing line, I saw this sort of extraordinary sight, which was um, several Afghan soldiers running down the hill out of their base and flagging down a civilian car and like pulling off their uniforms as they were doing it, still carrying their weapons and jumping into this civilian car and then just driving off. And that to me was really fascinating because I think traditionally when we talk about war and defending territory, you think that you would, you, you maybe even fight to the death, but you certainly fight until that very point where you can't fight any longer or it's clear that you can't win and, and then you might surrender. But this was a sniper taking pot shots at a base, which was actually pretty well fortified. The people who were more at risk were all the civilians in cars. Uh, um, in the sort of in, in that space in between. So it became really clear to me in that moment that no one in the US had fully understand what was happening, understood what was happening with the Afghan security forces. And when I, I went to Ghazni, I spent two days with the Taliban and then I came back to Afghanistan. And on the way back through that same checkpoint, there were a couple of soldiers there, but they were wearing civilian clothing and there were just one or two of them. And so the question that I had in that moment was, how is it possible that the US did not know this, did not understand that, and I think everyone understood that things were gonna collapse really quickly, but did not understand the degree to which they were going to collapse so quickly, did not understand the level of morale in terms of how low it was within the Afghan security forces, did not understand the extent to which resupply had meant that uh, Afghan soldiers were often had no choice but to surrender because they had no food, because logistics were so poor in terms of, and so all these questions that you sort of had to ask yourself, like how did the US not know this? How did it not see this coming? Not to say that it even could have prevented it had it seen or known this, but the big question was how did the US not know it? And then the next question, when I was asked you know, a day later on television, oh, they're saying now 30 days until Kabul falls. And I myself was said, that's ludicrous. That's not possible. Three days later, Kabul fell. So I was also guilty of, 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 of not understanding how quickly things were unraveling, but I don't have security clearance. Um, so I, you know, I'm obviously not privy to a lot of the details that, um, that our military and political leaders and intelligence services are. The second question that really came to my mind as we were then watching this extraordinary moment unfold, the Taliban sweep to power, the US is uh, trying to quickly airlift as many people out as possible. The Taliban are helping them in that endeavor in terms of providing a perimeter at the airport. It's absolute chaos, um, it's heartache, it's devastation. In other parts of the country, it's a giant party, it's a celebration. And I thought to myself, what, what are just the optics of this moment to the world, right? What does this look like? And, 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 and is there any scenario in which something sort of positive can be salvaged from this about what American partnership means and what American intervention means and, um, and what you know, America's ideals of, of you know, purporting to be like really strong purveyors of human rights means. And I sort of came up with a kind of gloomy scenario whereby to the people who supported the US and many of the women in Kabul in city centers who were educated, it was clear that promises had been made, dreams had been encouraged and that those were no longer available 
to them in this moment. It just became clear that those were illusory and that with the US withdrawing, those dreams that they had had were no longer dreams that they could pass on to their children or to continue to believe in. And so fairly or unfairly, because I don't wanna sound like I'm just railing on the US here, but there is a strong perception, not just in Afghanistan, that the US is an unreliable ally, that it is a fickle ally, that its commission, uh, commitments only last as long as an election cycle lasts. And you know that's not just something that we've seen in Afghanistan, we've seen it recently as well with uh, Kurdish allies in Northeast and Syria. I think there's a very strong sense, even from people who support US intervention and support the US playing a major role in the Middle East, there is a sense that the US is not, um, not going to necessarily honor its commitments and go the distance with an ally. To the people who hate the US or do, you know, do not appreciate the US's role in the region, the optics of the moment were equally striking and kind of dismal in the sense that you had uh, the world's greatest, most powerful military might being essentially effectively challenged and overthrown in a sense even by a bunch of guys fighting with AKs in sandals. And so how does that look? Um, to a lot of people in, in, in the region and beyond. And what does that say about US strength or US weakness? And then of course you have more neutral observers. And I just would say that from my conversations with them and interactions with them on the ground, there's a sort of sense now um, that I get from talking to people that people are now looking around, like the US is no longer the only act in town and people are looking around for other options and other state actors who might be able to offer investment assistance or whatever it may be. And there is a sense among some that China offers potentially a more, is a more transactional thing, but it's more transparent as well. And it's like, what you see is what you get. And this is the deal and we give you this and we take that. And, you know, no one's saying that it's um, it's about ideals or anything like that. But I feel like the the sort of the death of idealism is sort of what we're talking about today too, in terms of the U.S.'s role in the region, because people don't really um, don't really be believe in that anymore, honestly. So, and then just very quickly, the only other two things I would mention is just uh, you know from the perception, uh, a lot of people think that oh, President Trump and he, he made us focus so much on the US and, 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 and we stopped engaging with the world and we stopped caring about our partners and now President Biden's out there and he's talking about you know how important it is for the world's democracies to corral together and act as a bulwark against authoritarianism. But I would say in the eyes of many um, in the region, the long goodbye, as I've often heard it referred to, started way before Donald Trump. Um, it started under President Obama and it has always been a kind of underlying theme of, of America's sort of reluctance often to get involved in, um, you know, in, in the world's problems. So, um, and then the only other thing I want to say very briefly, because I'm conscious that I have one minute left after saying, oh, I don't need 10 minutes. I'm like here rabbiting on, um, but I'm hopefully just planting some seeds for us to, to discuss in the Q&A. Um, but I just wish one thing that Americans don't sometimes understand about the Middle East and about intervention is that non-intervention is a form of policy too. And non-intervention has consequences too. And some people I think want to believe that if we just don't get involved, it's not our problem, but that's not the way the world works, unfortunately. And I will be very interested to see what happens in Afghanistan in the coming years. And I'm not talking so much short term, but longer term. I would not be surprised at all if we see some kind of a return to Afghanistan, not at all in the way um, that it was obviously most recently, but the problem of Afghanistan, the problem of the proliferation of uh, various groups that are operating in Afghanistan that don't at the moment have any um, significant threat transnationally, but which certainly could do in, well, I mean, depends what estimates you hear from 18 months to five years. 
the problem doesn't just go away just because we're not there anymore. So um, I think that's something to discuss maybe and, and, and think about as we talk more broadly about the issue of the US role in the Middle East. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna turn it over now to Nabi, uh, recognizing that he is in Beirut and has an unstable connection <laughs> again. <laughs> well, so let's ask, I mean, I mean, can you hear me first of all? Am I audible? Yes. Great, all right, so let's stick with that then. I won't turn on the video because I turned it on before and there was trouble, etc. So I'm gonna just basically talk and I hope my voice will be interesting enough. <laughs> so, um, well, so I'll start off actually a little bit as well, just giving you a background of my time in Afghanistan. Um, and I basically visited the first time, I mean, I mean, the first time this year I went in May and then I uh, basically just missed <laughs> the plane into Kabul. In fact, my flight uh, was on early Monday morning. So I scrambled from Beirut uh, to, uh, to Dubai to get the visa. And then basically a few hours later, of course, I got word that the flight was canceled and I had a visa for a government that no longer exists. And then I managed to get in a week later with the Qatari flights uh, and I stayed uh, for about three weeks. So until about September 14 and throughout the takeover, etc. And, and I just have to say, I mean, I mean that I think actually people did know, right? The fact is that, that when we talk about Afghanistan as a failure, it's worth noting that actually, you know, there were a lot of people, I think, in government and, and, and in the U.S. who actually did know that the situation was dire, but they were constantly putting on a pretty face in the sense that, you know, although there were all these, you know, really massive systemic issues, uh, they believed they would be okay. And of course, they believed essentially that there was time fix up any of those problems uh, with the withdrawal of the, the ANDSF of the Financial Security Forces would actually hold on for a little bit. Um, and of course, it, it quickly became clear in the last, uh, in the last uh, uh, you know, days of July and then of course, beginning of August that that wasn't the case. But the seeds of that were actually, you know, you know seen before. And the best example of this for me was really the Air Force. Um, and Clarissa touched upon this when she mentioned the issue of resupply. But it's worth noting how difficult resupply was. And the reason why this was, this was the case was because the Taliban actually controlled 80% of the highways. And this was in May, so before the massive offensive that culminated with the, with the downfall of Kabul. And what that really meant was, I mean, it was that the army actually couldn't actually um, I mean, resupply any of these small checkpoints. You're talking about, if memory serves, about 8,000 checkpoints uh, in, throughout the country, so checkpoints and outposts. And what that meant was, was that the vast majority of these had to actually be resupplied by helicopter. And so I went on one of these flights, uh, you know, we were in Kandahar and we went from there uh, to, uh, to the uh, Shaikot mountain area. And there was a base. And I remember, you know, we're flying with, the, with this Black Hawk and the guy basically turns to us and says, hey, look, we're gonna descend quickly, but don't worry, it's, it's fine. And I think to myself, I mean, what is this gonna be? It's gonna be a milk run. I mean, the guy had got, literally he, he brought milk he brought eggs, he brought a live sheep because it was AIDS and they wanted to slaughter a sheep for the, for the occasion. Um, he brought some, you know, like bags of flour and rice, etc., and of course some water. I mean, this was all basic stuff and this was all being taken in a Black Hawk helicopter that cost them out to what, like $4,000 an hour to operate. So clearly this wasn't sustainable. And then what happened was actually the Black Hawk had to swoop down from about 10,000 feet, race very, very close to the ground, almost screeched to a halt. And I say this and, and actually, you know, like literally it was true. It just, it just screeched to a halt, you know, and, and it came to the base. Uh, the, the crew threw away everything very quickly, right? It was, I mean, it was all done in under a minute. And even then one of the people who was picking up the supplies got shot uh, by a Taliban sniper. And, and the helicopter just, you know, zoomed again and basically jackknifed into the sky. And, I, you know, I say all this because, you know, this just illustrates to you how difficult it was to resupply anything there. And, and the problem is, is that the actual helicopter, I mean, the helicopters had a lot of wear and tear, of course, but the maintainers uh, just weren't there. I mean, they were all contractors. And this really went down across the, uh, the, the Afghan National Security Forces. I mean, it was to the point where, you know, Afghan officers, um, I, mean, I, I mean, actually couldn't resupply bullets or fuel. This was how bad it was. They were relying on contractors. And so when the US went to zero, so did the contractors, and there was nothing in place to make that work. I mean, there was actual talk about, you know, Zoom sessions, right? I mean, imagine the notion of doing Zoom, you know, in this base and trying to repair a Black Hawk. It's just, it's just a farcical situation, right? And again, I mean, this continues throughout. And so when we hear about, you know, the notion of the of Afghans escaping or, or, or giving up, it's because they simply just didn't have, well, I mean, they didn't have the money, they didn't have the bullets, they didn't have the food, they had nothing. 
And more importantly, they saw time and again how disconnected they were from the officials above them. You look at you look at Ghani, right? You look at you look at uh, you know Hamdullah Muhib, who was the was the Afghan National Security Council head. These were people who had no knowledge of military matters, and yet they were in charge of of defending you know the uh, the government. So it was just a situation where you know you have this real disconnect between what is happening on the ground and what was perceived. But there were people in government, both in Afghanistan and the U.S., who knew, and it just wasn't said. And I suppose that's really the main issue for me, right? I want to talk a little bit just about the disconnect. And and in the nine years, and like in, you know, in the nine years I've been doing this, um, you know, I'm just struck time and again by the disconnect in what the U.S. thinks is happening in the region, and what's actually happening in the region, and how people there perceive it. And this disconnect also just continues with the notion of of, of, of what Americans and the West believe is possible. To, you know, with military intervention and the messy reality of that aftermath. And finally, you know, what's considered acceptable, you know, as a, as a, as a way to pursue aims of policy and the consequences of those policy. And that brings us pretty nicely to Afghanistan also, again, whether it's the issue of drones. And as we saw, I mean, I mean, I was there when that last a drone strike happened and, and you could just instantly tell that these were civilians, right? They, these weren't ISIS-K fighters. You just had this family completely wiped out. And it was unbelievable. Just the, just the sheer, constant mendacity of it all right with the uh, with you know with all these uh just uh, just pronouncements of righteous strikes etc and just this complete um inability to believe that anything was wrong uh, you know until we actually got a lot of journalists in there as well so the problem is really is that you know we, we need to have i think a serious discussion uh or i should say i would hope that we could have a serious discussion about the legacy when it comes to actually judicious use of the us um of its, sorry, the audio is flipping, um, because of its military might. And so, sorry, let me just uh, get to this. And, and so we, and here we can also talk about sanctions as well. The problem is, of course, is that sanctions when it comes to the Taliban, right now we're facing an economic cataclysm in the country without any way of getting dollars in there. And so unless that situation is, is remedied, we're gonna have a total collapse of the project that's been built over the last 10 years. And yes, we're already seeing that with the Taliban takeover, but there are some things that can be preserved, and yet it's not because of the sanction situation now and the economic problems that are facing us. But of course, the problem is in all this is that, I mean, Josh was right, is that basically, you know, right now the interest in the Middle East is waning and it's, and it's gonna get worse. And the problem is, uh, you know, finally, is that this gives chances to leaders to do whatever they want, whether here or elsewhere, right? Without any kind of proper oversight, without any kind of proper uh, checks and balances. And we end up in a situation where, you know, 20 years later in Afghanistan, we have nothing to show for it. And I would argue that in the Middle East, it's actually worth, well, thinking of the return on investment more properly and realizing that the last 20 years, whether it was in Iraq or in Afghanistan or really in many other places, the interventions haven't come out as they should have, and they have certainly not yielded any benefit that I can see. And on that really quite dour note, uh, I end. Thank you so much. Um, uh, really appreciate your perspective and dialing in. Uh, we're grateful that the audio hung in there for a while. Um, so let me turn it over to Mina before we open it up for a discussion. Thank you, and thank you for the really insightful remarks. Um, you know, I'm, I'm talking to you all from Abu Dhabi and kind of the view from many Arab capitals in August 2021 20, was that we were witnessing a political earthquake. Um, the amount of stunned officials, senior uh, officials from different countries in the Middle East, who were who were baffled by how quickly all of this unraveled, but also how unprepared the United States appeared. And the tremors will continue for quite some time from this earthquake. It also accelerated trends that we've been witnessing in the region for some time when it comes to US foreign policy. So one is American withdrawal and this idea that you can end wars just by removing American troops. And of course, we heard that with Barack Obama's uh, campaign as a candidate saying he will end the war in Iraq. And rightly so, when he became president, he withdrew forces in 2011, said we're ending all our combat operations, and we ended the war in Iraq. Of course, that's 2011, 2014, ISIS is in full force and 
starts to control areas or at least Iraqi forces withdraw from areas that account to nearly a third of the country in addition to vast territories inside of Syria. So there was echoes of that. Another trend was this 180, de 180 degree turns that US foreign policy seems to take, again, largely seen from Barack Obama administration followed by the Donald Trump administration and the current Biden administration. By that time, I mean, during the Barack Obama administration, there was this idea that we extend our hand, for example, to Cuba and reverse American traditional policy and say that it's possible to do that with Donald Trump, of course, famously with North Korea, um, extending hands with people that you, know, you would have assumed the United States would never do unless there was actual change in behavior or character, and there wasn't. And then, of course, with the Taliban, which started with Donald Trump and ended with um, Joe Biden. And so, or continued with Joe Biden rather. And so there was this idea that 180 degree turns can happen suddenly by the United States and your friends and foes have to adjust their alliances and relationships accordingly. Another trend that was accelerated by what we witnessed in Afghanistan was this idea that there was a distancing between America and its NATO allies. Again, the amount of officials, be they French, be they Canadian, uh, we clearly heard from British members of parliament that they were stunned by how the United States had gone about this and really hadn't conferred with their allies who had fought side by side with them for two decades. And so again, this was an accelerated trend. It wasn't necessarily new, something that we witnessed at different moments with the Barack Obama administration and the Donald Trump administration. So that distancing from NATO allies and what does you know, an America first kind of policy look like. And I think that's a theme that you're going to really see stick when you look at American foreign policy that is America first, even if it's not called that way by all uh, American presidents, let's say, but really Donald Trump encapsulated that, and that's how it's being seen from the region. And it was fascinating to hear again from officials and diplomats how US officials were calling countries in the region for help to help evacuate their people, to help evacuate others from Afghanistan. And there was a sense that the US dropped the ball, but also that they didn't immediately reach out to those regional allies, only when they felt they absolutely had to. And so that element of trust and this idea that we're all on the same page is further eroded. And so the question is, after the withdrawal from Iraq in 2011 and then the emergence of ISIS 2014, 10 years later, in 2021, with the withdrawal from Afghanistan, where will we be in two to three years? And unfortunately, at the moment from the region, there isn't a sense that there's a clear American strategy of what actually happens. As we heard from various um, military officials, various analysts, that we see um, you know, we see this move uh, towards uh, more terror groups forming uh, in or, or gathering in Afghanistan, what is actually the policy to stop them? And that isn't clear. Um, so, so how that view of the United States in the region is, differs in some ways between friends and foes, of course. The friends of the United States are worried, they're disappointed, as I said, there's some trust broken. There's also an idea that they must create new alliances, and that's been alluded to by other speakers, so I won't go into detail here, but very much echo and agree with the views that have been stated here, be it China, but be it also regional allies. But there's also a sense of frustration that the United States always says that it bears the costs alone, where in reality, first of all, the number of victims and civilians that are killed are by far higher in um, this region and where America's wars or America's intervention has been, but also when it comes to money spent, a lot of money and treasure has been spent by the region, in addition to the fact that a lot of American uh, weapons makers and sellers are incredibly richer today than they were two decades ago. So that money isn't being spent on building hospitals and schools in the region, it really is being spent to arms contractors primarily and others that made a lot of money. The foes, on the other hand, are watching all of this and clearly are emboldened. And the foes are also able to make noises now that perhaps, again, two, three years ago would have been different. And those noises are that we're right here and we're not going out anywhere. And we will stick it out much longer than the Americans. And as I am originally from Iraq and all issues for me lead to Iraq, that is very, very true today when it comes to Iraq and Iranian-backed militias. And there is a sense that while they took a blow with the killing of Qasem Soleimani and Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis by the United States, 
by uh, Donald Trump in 2020, January 2020's decision, Donald Trump's decision to do so, you see today that the militias feel emboldened, um, militarily at least. And so that is an important development. Um, the legacy of the United States in the region, 20 years on, the US seems no longer invincible and no longer uh, indispensable. And the moral authority that they may have claimed is much less so now, particularly when you saw the Afghans were trying to flee, that both Clarissa and Nabih did an incredible job of bringing their voices, otherwise wouldn't be heard, and, and incredible journalists on the ground then. Um, th the fact that they would be abandoned in that way by the United States, I think, will be seared in people's minds for decades to come, particularly in this part of the world. And so a lot of America files and people who support the United States vision or, or believe that even when it makes mistakes, ultimately, that the United States is a better influence than not being present in the region, those actors and those voices are really also discredited with the United States. So regardless of intentions, the outcomes are incredibly troubling now. Another problem is that so far, it seems that many of America's allies in the region suffer from severe corruption sometimes enabled by some of the systems and the policies that the United States supports and enables. And more and more people in the region are absolutely tired of the corruption that is eating away at different systems. And so I think the United States has to tackle that element that some of its closest allies, particularly those that they help prop up in different countries, are also incredibly corrupt. And questions also about democracy and promotion of democracy and the legacy that the United States actually left with that. Um, another point to, to raise, I, I'll, I'll wrap up now by saying the future of American policy. And again, friends and foes are looking to try to understand what the future of American policy it seems. Um, one, people would like to see whether the US will go back to a largely bipartisan approach to foreign policy, because at the moment it seems to flip after each election, as was said, a little earlier. So whether that is possible, it doesn't seem that domestically, given the climate in the United States, we'll see that. And so there is much more short termism in building any deals or agreements with the United States than previously. In addition to that, there is a real sense that the future of American policy will be determined by its relationship with China, but also seeing that China is on the rise inevitably. Uh, China has been the largest foreign investor in the Middle East North Africa region since 2016. So for the last five years, being the largest foreign investor, and that, that continues to escalate. Um, I don't think that anybody will start to think, okay, we'll unwind our relationships with China for the benefit of the United States. And of course, another important trend line that people will look out to is the idea of terrorism and whether it will impact US thinking or whether more of these terrorist groups, extremist groups, will focus their activities more locally rather than target American interests directly, because they realize that unless they target American interests directly, they could probably get away with much more than they used to be able to not so recently. Um, and so with that, I'll, I'll wrap up my, my remarks. I look forward to your questions. Great. Thank you so much. Really valuable to have a perspective from the region uh, on what's going on. Um, so I'm going to just throw out a couple of questions for the panelists to respond to. And, you know, you have you can pick and choose um, and then I'll uh, open it up and get to some of the questions in the Q&A. We have about half an hour left. Um, so let me just start by saying that, um, you know, drawing on Josh's recent piece in, uh, in foreign affairs, he makes the point that, um, okay, um, credibility loss may be overstated and it's context specific, um, but there are some, it seems, real costs for U.S. reputation. And I actually hear this echoed quite a bit in the comments of the panelists, you know, for the reputation of the United States for being competent, for its commitment to human rights. And I will say personally, as a specialist on the Middle East who spends a lot of time there uh, for a long time, I don't think most people in the region thought that the United States was committed to democracy and human rights. Um, and, uh, and those who rhetorically claimed it was, we're not sure they really believe that in their hearts. Um, and then also this loss of US reputation as a leader in the international community. So I hear a lot of support for that argument. Uh, and it was very interesting to me what Mina just said that even America files in the region are increasingly discredited, which is, um, you know, a, an, uh, an interesting development. So, um, so I'd be curious to hear um, the panelists thoughts on a few things. Um, 
Clarissa made this, I think, very important point that non-intervention is a policy too. Uh, so I'd be curious to hear what all the panelists have to say about what a better approach to policy should be. Um, clearly just pulling out uh, you know, ripping off the Band-Aid has consequences as well. So what might a different policy look like? Um, as Mina said, should this be building hospitals and schools instead of funding military uh, weapons uh, stores? Um, or or what, what might it look like? Um, and then I'd love to also get a perspective, um, particularly from those who have been on the ground uh, in the region about what life is like uh, right now for um, the people that have, you know, borne the brunt of uh, the Taliban um, and e American forces in the region. What is it looking like? How is it evolving now? And also, what uh, is what are your assessments of the Taliban in terms of their domestic governance strategies and their foreign policy? Uh, maybe it's too early to tell, but no, no political authority is ever monolithic. There's factions, and so it'd be be curious to hear what the different tendencies are within the Taliban and what their uh, positions might be both domestically and vis-a-vis -vis, uh, foreign policy. So uh, feel free to comment on this, uh, any of these points or others. Uh, maybe I'll just go through the panelists in the order that they presented. Uh, so Josh, starting with you. Th thanks very much. And I, I uh, went on too long at the beginning, so I'm going to keep my comments especially especially short now. Um, I mean, suffice to say, I, I agree with my foreign affairs piece. Um, but I more seriously, I mean, I think the um, I, to your question, I think the key distinction here is immediately after um, uh, these sort of very salient images, right, um, uh, that many of the folks here on this panel were able to sort of convey to us um, uh, with the U.S. withdrawal of Afghanistan and what its costs were. I think there were a lot of discussions um, in sort of popular discussions sort of saying, well, you know, if I if I was Taiwan, if I was, you know, Ukraine, right, and so I like obviously I, I'm sort of rethinking everything. And I, I think that those kinds of arguments are, are are a little bit questionable, right, in as much as the U.S. relationship with um, other countries, right, as, as Natalie mentioned, right, are very different, right. Um, but still, though, um, the as as I think Clarissa mentioned, right, um, these I mean, these heart wrenching images, right, that that we're seeing, right, these stories that are being conveyed, right, uh, are 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 really resonating, right, and really I think sort of speak to people such that it's hard um, it, it's hard to see the U.S. as this kind of competent uh, international kind of leader, right, in a way that I think Americans like to think of ourselves, I'm Canadian, so, you know, exclude me from this narrative, right, but uh, I, I, as being, and I think particularly, I mean, Mina's point about the domestic political angle here, I think, is key, right, um, because this, um, the sort of this demise of bipartisanship in foreign policy, one thing that it means, it doesn't just mean that policies sort of switch back and forth when, um, uh, uh, um, when different parties take control of the White House, right? It also means that the way um, uh, presidents implement policies when they are in the White House differs, right? So one reason why Trump was able to get out of the Iran nuclear deal so easily um, is because Obama had to issue it through executive order, right? Because um, he couldn't get it through Congress, right? And uh, what that meant is that Trump could then undo it through executive order as well, right? So there's a way in which um, this absence of bipartisanship then contributes uh, to the instability as, as, as Mina was, was saying. Um, and I, uh, I will, I will stop here rather than uh, rather than go on further. Thanks so much, uh, Natalie. Um, so I think just to to echo a little bit of of what others have mentioned and, and what I touched on a little bit in terms of what might other policies look like or what does non-intervention as a policy look like. I think Mina also mentioned this too, but I think it goes back to maybe sort of an issues-based approach. So in each context, like I mentioned with the Lebanon case, or you could imagine other countries where, you know, you're taking a look at where can the U.S. play a constructive role, and even if that's small, and maybe that's a way to start because we are trying to build back up from a trust deficit in the wake of Afghanistan, that that may be a way to think about which issues that the US should really be focused on. Um, I think the other angle too, and I think this gets back to the, the credibility issue, I do think going back to multilateral approaches where we can is important. I think that's, that's going to be true with the JCPOA. Obviously, it's a bit of an uphill battle because I think Part of the problem is we're coming to a different negotiating table than the one we started at back in 2015, right? I mean, we pulled out and now in a way Iran is taking its own maximalist approach 
to us on the other side, right? And things have changed in the interim. So I think, but but I do think, you know, re re-engaging and recommitting in meaningful ways on a multilateral level is one going to be one of the key ways that, that the US is going to have to execute any sort of policies um, in the region. Great, uh, Clarissa. Um, yeah, I guess I just give you a little bit of a sense of what life is like in Afghanistan. Um, there are many parts of Afghanistan, particularly in the South and Taliban strongholds like Helmand, Kandahar, um, where people are, as I said, delighted to see the back of the US um, associate 20 years of occupation with drone strikes and arbitrary detentions and endless fighting and um, all sorts of really negative associations. Women's education was never a priority in a lot of these rural areas. So some of the, the good stuff that the US brought has not necessarily had a strong impact. And the fact that they can now drive from Kandahar to Helmand um, is, is, is a real plus. You definitely see an improvement in the security situation in Afghanistan, largely speaking. And you can hear aid agencies, the Red Cross talk about this as well. They can actually drive convoys all around the country now where they couldn't before. So that's, you know, that's one side of things. On another uh, side, on a more urban, educated, aspirational, um, populace, I would say the picture is extremely bleak and uh, particularly for women. Uh, the Taliban had made all sorts of proclamations about things it was going to do differently this time around, but the fact that girls above sixth grade are not any longer allowed to go to school, I think is a pretty damning indictment. The excuse that's been given by the Taliban is that a proper Islamic environment needs to be created before they can go back to school. I have visited these schools. They are already gender segregated. So um, that argument doesn't really hold water. And by the way, it's the same argument that they used in the 1990s and they never let girls go back to school. So um, multiple cases as well of women not being, uh, being basically told not to go back to the office. And then you have um, a lot of what I would just call like self-policing as well. So like the Taliban doesn't necessarily issue a directive but people in anticipation of what they think the Taliban wants um, start to, police their own behavior, start to wear a burqa where maybe they didn't before, stop going to work because they're scared that they could get into trouble. Um, and so then you already start to feel a shift in a society. I will say that the Taliban's been quite savvy about, with the exception of the, the girls' school thing, which is a clear um, home goal for them, so to speak, they are being a lot more cautious about issuing directives at the moment. And that's because they desperately need acceptance from the international community and they desperately, desperately need to get the international aid unfrozen and flowing again. Afghanistan is in the precipice of a major economic catastrophe. Um, where we'll be talking about hunger um, on, on, on a serious level in, in the coming months. So the Taliban has tried to preserve this space they have at the moment, this transitional lull where they're getting some credit for providing some security, but they're not being forced to implement any real policy because they don't wanna do that yet because they want to unlock the funding before they commit to anything. At the same time, what we've seen from the interim government is obviously not encouraging no women, no ethnic minorities. And we're also seeing, and, and maybe Nabi will talk more about this, um, an internal schism within the Taliban with the Haqqani network versus uh, the more progressives. And I'm really using those um, liberally, such as uh, Mullah Baradar and uh, those who are more actively involved in the Doha talks and who had made certain commitments, which we now see are not being honored in, in terms of the makeup of that transitional government. And uh, indeed, there's a sense that people like Baradar have really been sidelined. So all of which is to say, and this is all against the backdrop of the economic catastrophe, as I said, but also a, a burgeoning ISIS insurgency, which is now really picking up steam as we've seen with these recent attacks in Kandahar and Kunduz and Kabul as well when I was just there. So it, 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 it's a bleak picture for many and a huge amount of challenges that it is not clear that the Taliban has really any idea of how to begin to go about rising to those challenges and providing good governance for the people who live under it. Great, thanks. Thanks for that perspective. And Nabi. 
Well, so I actually must say that I ag agree with Natalie in the sense that uh, I think that, that the U.S. should actually engage. I mean, I mean, non-intervention is not just you know just turning off the taps and going away, right? I mean, it is. I mean, there is a range. There is a spectrum, and I hope that the U.S. could actually apply some of that spectrum. Uh, more judiciously, whether it's with sanctions, whether it's with diplomatic overtures, whichever. And again, the situation with the gas in Lebanon is one example of where you can see that, and I hope that it'll happen more often. I admit to you, I don't think it will, but I do happen, but I do hope it'll happen more often. Uh, but I will talk a little bit just about the situation with the Taliban in general. Um, it's worth noting that the story, you know, it, I mean, it's like someone pressed to reset, essentially, right? Like, like all the stuff you knew before is now gone, right? Which, which is to say that you know, before you would really, really rarely see the Taliban, you'd have to like, you know, get in touch with people and try to organize it somewhere. And you, and you were never sure if the person was Taliban or just masquerading as Taliban. And then suddenly they're everywhere. And by everywhere, I mean, really everywhere. You know, I mean, I mean, you're walking in the street, there's the Taliban, and they were very, very interested in being on camera and talking. <clears throat> and again, I want to emphasize one thing, which is that, you know, the danger for someone like me, you know, as a man, as an American, etc., right? It's, it's, of course, nowhere near the level of danger for Afghan journalists, whether men or women, but especially for women. And so, uh, you know, and, I mean, I don't want to belittle the, the, you know, the dangers and the problems facing a local journalist there. But for us, at least for now, the Taliban were indeed showing a soft touch and were quite savvy, as Clarissa said. And uh, the sense here is that, actually, I mean, I mean, you still see women on the street, right? They're still there, but of course, fear is much more widespread. And you see women in banks, for example, right? They're still they're they're back to working there. Initially they weren't, but then they returned. Uh, but they're kept in a special area, right? And all this really is a harbinger of what the Taliban have in mind, which is which is basically to put women in a corner and just reduce their presence, except where it's really essential, whether in nursing or banking or you know, or functions like these, right? And of course, the problem is uh, is that there's an economic problem. I mean, I mean, there's an economic cataclysm approaching, right? And and the reason why is because Afghanistan has about 9.3 billion dollars in reserves expenditure. Now, this isn't a matter of aid, which is a separate issue entirely. I mean, the aid situation when it comes to Afghanistan is very dire. I believe it requires. Uh, well, I believe that basically aid funds about three quarters of its operating budget. Now, it's worth noting that there was additional budgetary stuff for the army, and now of course that's gone, so the Taliban will have to do it in theory. Um, but nevertheless, the country has $9.3 billion in reserves that are now stuck in the US, right? And because of the situation with the sanctions, they're frozen. And in fact, I mean, the Afghani, which is a local currency, is buttressed by, you know, every monthly, uh, like every month or so, every few weeks or so, they would send these bulk shipments of dollars. Those bulk shipments of dollars didn't come for the last time. So the country is going through a massive currency crunch right now when it comes to dollars. And that, of course, is going to affect the situation with buying. And so actually, even yesterday, I was talking to someone at State TV who was working there, and he told me that uh, he had actually not been paid since July. So as you can imagine, this is going to get you know, much, much worse as we go along, because A, there's no money, and B, the money that is there is going to be reduced in value. And so <clears throat> that's been the main issue that we're seeing. And the results of that have already been just these massive lies in front of banks. I mean, the main problem now is that people tell you, yes, there's peace, but there's no money, right? And you know, what that's done is that people are forced to wait for a day or even more in front of a bank, you know, with these just gargantuan one line, right, just so they can take out a certain amount of money, which at this point, I believe is about $200 or 10,000 Afghani per week. Yes, I understand, it's just not much at all. And so, you know, in that sense, the country really is going through a dire situation. Um, as for the issue of Taliban schisms, etc. Now, I admit to you, I mean, I mean, we have heard of that, right? right? We've heard reporting of, of a fight with, with Beredar and his people. Um, I can't tell you, I, I mean, I can tell you that the Taliban, of course, said no, you know, like none of this happened, and they presented a, a, a happy face. And you see this very often with someone like Anas Haqqani, who's one of the younger, you know, more hip Haqqanis, actually. I mean, I mean, if he didn't have the turban, he wouldn't look out of place in a bar in Brooklyn, frankly, with this beard and everything. I mean, you get the sense the guy's going to open up a microbrewery any second now. Anyway. Um, but yes, I mean, I mean, the, I mean, I mean, the situation now with the Taliban is that there is security, but there is no money, and that's going to just lead to you know a worse, worse situation going forward, especially with you know this legions of, of of young men with no money and no chance of employment. And that's it. Great. <laughs> Again, a dour note. <laughs> yeah, it's hard to avoid that. Um, yeah. Uh, Mina. Um, 
Well, I wanted to tackle the non-intervention point that you raised um, and that Clarissa had, had eloquently put, which is non-intervention is a policy in itself. And of course, Syria is, is the prime example of that United States decision to say, okay, we're not gonna intervene, so that will sort out. And the problem is, is usually non-intervention still includes a bit of intervention because the United States continues to have just a few but significant presence of actual military presence inside of Syria. Uh, furthermore, every now and then you'll get certain strikes in a particular country, that's intervention. Supporting a few opposition groups here and there is intervention. And the problem is what, what people are getting frustrated by in the region quite often is that the United States intervenes enough to, to confuse the situation, but not enough to tip the balance. And that was one of the things that happened with Syria that some people say, well, actually if the United States hadn't declared early support for the opposition and kind of stayed hands off, it, the civil war, as terrible as it was and as bad as the situation is with the Bashar al-Assad regime, probably would have wrapped up um, much quicker than it did. So I would just say that the United States continues to be a superpower, will continue to influence the situation and kind of has to own that and not underestimate its influence or try to shy away from the influence it knows it had and but actually deal with it responsibly. Um, and just very briefly on Afghanistan, I would say in addition to the very terrible situation of people inside of the country, there's also all of those who left the country and in some ways the attention span was, okay, these people got out so they're okay. And actually no, they're having to pick up their lives from scratch as difficult as, for example, the economic situation is inside the country, it's also very difficult for some of those who left. Everything from trying to open up a bank account, some bank accounts are frozen inside of Kabul, others in, inside of Afghanistan, others outside of the country can't even get a bank account, or anything else that can be semblance of normality or effective living. And I would say that the Taliban's greatest challenge is going to be, of course, governance. As for the security point, I would say that, don't forget, we've just had two major bombings that have particularly targeted um, the Shia minority in Afghanistan. Now, while ISIS is laying claim to this, this is their way to undercut uh, the Taliban, but some people will say, you know, we said at least we can deal with the Taliban, maybe the security situation will get better. I'm not so sure it will be, and that will really discredit them even further. So they're going to be scrambling to try to put some semblance of at least being able to provide security. Great. Um, well, we have about 10 minutes or so left. So I want to turn to the Q&A that our uh, attendees have been uh, populating. And there's some, I'll try to cluster together some of these questions and just, you know, if the panelists would just sort of jump in or raise their hand or whatever, if they want to uh, respond. So we have, um, and, and I should also say that one of our attendees rightly pointed out that the sort of title of this panel, the Middle East, gives the impression that we're sort of clumping South Asia and Afghanistan and Central Asia into one bucket. And I certainly do not want to do that. You know, I, I work on the Middle East and I would not claim to be an Afghanistan specialist. Like this is not in academia considered part of the region and not in the World Bank's classification. And I'm sure for others as well in the policy world. So, um, so it's a bit of a misnomer, but you know, the, the title perhaps butchers that, um, but, uh, but, but let me turn to these uh, really uh, thoughtful questions we have here. And uh, one cluster of questions has to do with, you know, what are the main threats in the region? So maybe, um, uh, and the region again, broadly defined, not just uh, Middle East, North Africa, which itself is a, multi a variegated region. Um, uh, what are the main threats? What about Yemen? We're not hearing much about Yemen that sort of off the American journalism, you know, uh, mainstream press radar screen because there's so much other stuff going on among other reasons. Um, and uh, and in Syria, which some of our panelists have touched on, uh, what about um, American relations with South Asian powers? What about the U.S.-Pakistani relationship? What about the U.S. relationship with India? Um, and I think China keeps coming in here quite a bit. Really interesting to hear uh, Mina remind us that China has been the largest foreign investor in the Middle East uh, you know, since 2016 and adopts a very different policy. We're not getting involved in your domestic stuff. We don't care about democracy, human rights. <laughs> We're just investing in uh, uh, other things. Um, uh, so what about China's role? And of course, there's Iran, um, you know, always lurking there. So there's a number of questions about these uh, bilateral relationships and what they mean for the region and American policy more generally. So if anyone wants to jump in, please, please do so. Well, I mean, I mean, I can jump in about Yemen if you like, only because I was there not so long ago. Great. Um, 
so so um, well, actually, come to think of it, it, it was it was a few months ago, so it has been a while. Um, so when I was there, I went to Shabwa, which is basically you know it's it's on the coast, of course. It's it's considered kind of south of Yemen, really. So so it's like the linchpin province between the north and the south, but it extends all the way down to the Red Sea coast and the south. Um, and and the problem is, of course, is that you know we we had reached at that time, I should say, a stalemate. Right, with all these various groups jockeying for power still, whether it was the Southern Transitional Council, which is this, this part that centered around Aden and that was for a while supported by the UAE. Um, I believe still so, actually it is. Uh, and of course, then you had the government, which was supported ostensibly by Saudi, but there are different factions within that. And you had, uh, of course, the Houthis in the north. And so, I mean, the problem with Yemen really is, is, is that if you want to actually discuss the story to begin with, you have to go through so much exposition, you're actually writing 700 words of exposition before you actually get to the meat of the story. And I must tell you that in terms of interest when it comes to Yemen, it's very, very, very limited. And this is, and this is despite the fact that it's incredibly tragic and just an awful story in, in, in so many ways. And it couldn't have happened to a more beautiful, more fascinating country. I mean, I fell in love with Yemen the first time I went there and, and I just adore the place. And so, you know, what happened, it really breaks my heart. Um, now, with that being said, uh, the situation now is worse. Uh, I mean, the issue is, is that the Houthis have no reason to actually really surrender. You know, it's the same thing with the Taliban. Uh, and the Taliban were effectively winning, right? Um, I mean, I mean, in the case of the Houthis, you know, they and perhaps, I mean, they weren't winning as much as the Taliban, but now they generally are. And, and they had managed to actually, uh, you know, advance into areas of Shabwa for a bit and of course Ma'rib. And, and all this is very worrisome because there really is no uh, long-term solution to this. And of course, you should add that there's the issue of the oil tanker. And this oil tanker was actually used as a, as a storage facility for the oil that was coming into Yemen. Um, it's obviously quite old and there's no maintenance to speak of. Th this thing might rupture at any moment. It's a single hull design, which is to say that the moment actually there's any kind of breach, you'll see you know, gallons of oil just basically uh, you know, going to the sea. And of course, this will have disastrous shipping. Uh, there's have like a disastrous effect on shipping, on the environment, and especially on Yemen, because that'll actually disrupt any kind of shipments of food in a country that relies entirely on foreign aid to get any kind of food going. So again, the bearer of bad news, I'm sorry to say, but there, there we are. Thank you so much. I think there was recently a really uh, excellent New Yorker piece on this uh, tanker um, parked off of Yemen, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so anyone else wanna jump in? Just on the threats, it's a, it's a long list, but I would say that militant groups of different variations are problematic. And at that state structures that start to break away at certain points when what we're witnessing in Lebanon is incredible. The acceleration of, of you know, state structures falling apart and being able to, to provide support so forth and Lebanese as, as, as a people are going through so much, but also the geopolitical fallout if this continues and what that means. But also militant groups that are largely um, anti-American and will find ways to target interests of the US directly or indirectly. As I said, I think they're learning the lesson of not going directly to target their um, interests. Another one is energy. I think quite often in the United States, there's this idea that the, that the US is you know, energy efficient. So it doesn't actually matter what happens to energy supplies, but without energy, the global economy tanks and that does not serve United States interests. So they want a global economy that functions and so forth. So actually energy supplies continue to be quite important to the United States. Um, Iran is a major issue. I think there is a threat there, uh, particularly because of the, the actions of Iran in the, in the wider region. Um, but also then you have other uh, countries that are increasing their influence and trying to undercut the influence of the United States and to show that the United States is an empire in decline. And so this, how does that um, impact the status, let's say, of the United States? And in addition to this whole idea of militant groups, I'd also say about weapons proliferation, not just nuclear weapons, which is often and biological weapons, which is often what captures people's attention, but just the general amount of weaponry, corrupt money that's around, smuggling that's around, that cannot serve the interests of the United States in the long term, even if they can, if they think they can buy off different groups. In the end, it always comes back to be quite detrimental. Great. 
Natalie? Yeah, I was just going to jump in. I think um, Mina was making some little points that I was I was sort of mulling over. I think just first off, I also don't have a background in Southeast Asia, so I'm really not a position to comment on broader U.S. policy there. But um, in the context of threats, I, I was thinking maybe as opposed to threat in the strictest sense, but getting more to this issue of stability, which I know Mina just mentioned, Lebanon came to mind and broader destabilizing effect of things going south in places um, like Lebanon. But I think also um, some of the questions asked, you know, what's U.S. interest in places like Yemen. Um, I would defer to Mina on Iraq, but I think the, all those countries also still raise questions about kind of broader stability issues long term, and that is not a threat per se, but something that I think is something that can draw the U.S. in back in over time, or at least require us to refocus, as we talked about earlier on. Um, so yeah, I'll just add that in. Uh, anyone else want to jump in, or I can throw another question in the mix? Um, I mean, the, the, I guess the one thing I, one thing I would say, so I, I, I agree with um, what others have said. That, I mean, I think if you look in sort of the grand historical sweep or whatever, there's sort of been four central um, kind of core interests in American policy in the Middle East, right? One is sort of energy, right? As, as, as Mina mentioned, right? One is uh, preventing outside interference, right? Whether it's sort of Soviets from interfering or whether it's um, sort of non-state actors, or I guess semi-state actors, maybe like um, like ISIS, right? Um, one uh, uh, supporting allies and partners in the region, although different administrations have taken very different stances on what exactly that means, right? Trump and Obama had very different views on, on that, say. And then the fourth one being nuclear non-proliferation, right? And so those are sort of traditionally been the four core interests, right? Um, and there's there's rhetoric about human rights sometimes, right? And sometimes there's follow through and sometimes much of the time there isn't, right? Um, uh, but those seem to be the sort of the four core ones. Um, and so I, uh, that just sort of take different forms in, in different different periods. Um, I think that actually addresses, but maybe others want to jump in further, or Josh, you want to elaborate. One of the questions uh, in the Q&A that popped up 10 years after the Arab Spring, what are the normative values and ideals that shape U.S. foreign policy towards the region? So Josh, your response kind of addresses that. And I, I wonder more generally, do we think that values uh, and, and norms are shaping policy or is it sort of real politique and uh, is this, you know, is this uh, just window dressing? I mean, I'll, I'll jump in quickly there just to say, we, we've seen, you know, just the conversations we were having at the G7 with Biden, uh, you know, attending as president of the United States. And it was such a different tone from what we'd heard under President Trump. And it was America's back and it was about diplomacy and building consensus. And, you know, democracies aren't going to take the ascent of autocracies lying down and we're going to act as a bulwark to authoritarianism. And then that was kind of the, the, the beautiful window dressing. And then the sort of disaster, you know, whether you agree with the decision to end the war is sort of irrelevant, but the, 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 the disaster of, the, of how the Afghan war um, ultimately finished and unraveled sort of laid bare, I think, a lot of the glaring discrepancies in US policy with regards to what the ideals are versus what the reality is. And, and I think that, you know, Mina sort of touched on this too, and it's such an important point those sort of mini interventions, the constant like, no, we're not intervening, but we're doing this, we're doing that, we're doing this. And by the way, when President Obama says Bashar al-Assad must go, he then sort of has to make him go. Or if he doesn't make him go, then it's a credibility issue. I mean, the great words of Lyndon Johnson, right? Never tell a man to go to hell unless you can make him go there. And so I think America is always struggling with this desire to present this front of, you know, this is who we are and this is what we stand for and this is what our values are within the very messy, ugly business of kind of running nation states, right? And, and carving out what we want and, 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 and implementing our will as a, you know, a global hegemon on the rest of the world. And so I, in some ways, I think that China has kind of beat us to the punch by being like, you know what, we're not gonna pretend to be like really great people. And <laughs> we're not gonna pretend that this is all about peace and love and, and, and humanitarian values. We're gonna be like, we need that, we want that, we'll pay you for it, what do you, you know, and just have a much more transparent transactional approach to a lot of these issues. So I mean, that doesn't really necessarily answer your question, but I do think 
the sort of the world has seen now that there is this glaring disparity between what the U.S. says and what it does. And and for years, it was a question of like, does the U.S. actually believe this stuff? Does it really think that this is how the rest of the world sees and understands its interventions and actions? Does it believe it itself? And I think it's become increasingly clear that um, that, you know, that 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 I think the U.S. is more self-aware as a nation and as a, as a people of what what motivates a lot of these policy decisions. And so maybe it's time to think about what the possibilities would be of having more um, measured and humbled expectations in, in, your, in your rhetoric and the policy goals that you set out for yourself. Great, really uh, excellent commentary. Um, we are unfortunately out of time. It has been a huge honor to have all of these amazing panelists join us here this morning, this afternoon, depending where you're dialing in from. And uh, thank you so much for sharing your time with us and your insight and keep up the excellent work. Thank you. Thank you.